Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode three of Japan Foundation's pop culture series. I'm Sakuya Mio, and I'm back at the Japan Foundation's New York office with my arts and culture team. This episode, we will focus on the music in anime. For those of you watching this, I imagine you already know how important the soundtrack is for the overall experience of anime. I personally can't imagine my life without a music of Joe Saishi, Yoko Kano, and Yuki Kajula, who are all legendary anime composers. But have you ever thought about the role of music in storytelling and what meanings might be hidden in the music? Today, we have invited three musicologists researching anime music, and would you like to explore how music is created for the storytelling and world building using the, magic of, uh, using the music of beloved anime series, specifically works from Studio Ghibli, Cowboy Bebop, and a recent smash hit, Your Name, as an example. Our first speaker is Dr. Kunio Hara from the University of South Carolina. Hello. Hi. His research interests include Puccini's operas, exoticism, and orientalism in music, nostalgia, and music in post-war Japan. In his book, Joe Saishi's soundtrack for My Neighbor Totoro, he analyzed how Joe Saishi, the legendary music composer, was able to harness the feeling of nostalgia in Ghibli music. Our second speaker is Ms. Rose Bridges from, Hi, Uni Hi. from University of Texas, Austin. She is a PhD candidate researching film music and sound, especially animation and popular music of the 1960s to 80s. In her book, Hi. Yoko Kano's Cowboy Bebop soundtrack, she introduces Yoko Kano's eclectic style and analyzes how the music tells the stories of characters in Cowboy Bebop. And our third speaker is Dr. Stacy Jokoy from Texas Tech University. Her research explores the intersections of music, politics, and constructions of gender, focusing on the functions of musical narratives in a context. Especially, she has researched a wide variety of topics relating to music in anime, such as Ruroni Kenshin, Classical Loys, Your Name, and recently, the use of Irish music in a fantasy anime. As a guest editor of the upcoming Mechadenia Soundscapes, she is one of the scholars who possess the most extensive network and vast experiences in this field, and she will be the moderator as well as the speaker today. For more information about our guest speakers, please check their official websites from the links we put in the description box below. Today, we will begin our program with a short pre pre recorded presentations about world building in anime from each guest speaker. Kunio will talk about Ghibli, Rose about Cowboy Bebop, and Stacy about your name. We also created a playlist on Spotify where you can listen to the songs they discuss in the presentations. You can find a link in, to the playlist in the description box below too. After their presentations, they will have a live discussion and a Q&A session. Please feel free to comment or ask questions in the live chat. Although we have already received a lot of questions from the registrants in advance, we will try to answer as many of your questions as possible. Finally, this is a quick reminder to please keep the live chat on YouTube clean and friendly. Also, please be warned, there are some spoilers in this content. So now let's move on to the pre-recorded presentation, starting with Kunio. I will return later for the Q&A session. See you later. Hello. My name is Kunio Hara, and I'm an Associate Professor of Music History at the University of South Carolina. Before I start my brief talk about music and Studio Ghibli films, I would like to thank Saku Yamio and the Japan Foundation of New York for giving me this opportunity to share my research. And thank you all for joining the stream today. I look forward to your questions and comments. When discussing the music in the animated films of Studio Ghibli, 
we should first consider the surprisingly large number of audio recordings that accompany them. For instance, there are seven recordings connected to Miyazaki's 1986 film Castle in the Sky. They are in the order of release. The Image album, the original soundtrack album, the symphony album, the single of the film's theme song, the drama album, the high-tech series album, and the revised soundtrack album for its US release in 2003. This table lists Studio Ghibli's feature-length anime and the different types of recordings associated with them. As you can see, all the films have accompanying original soundtrack albums, which typically include the music that are heard in the films. Drama albums reproduce the entire film soundtracks, or the combination of works, music, sound effects, and dialogues. Many of these albums are arrangements made for the symphony orchestra, chamber ensembles, or synthesizers. Studio Ghibli also released theme songs from select films. Some anime also came with novelty albums, such as a karaoke album for My Neighbor Totoro, and a retro album of nostalgic oldies from Isao Takahata's Only Yesterday. But the most important category of recordings associated with Studio Ghibli, especially for Miyazaki, is the image album. Image album is a phrase phrase used to describe a concept album associated with a film. The image albums that accompany Studio Ghibli anime are produced and sold prior to the release of the films themselves. Case in point is the image album for Miyazaki's second feature-length film, Naoshika of the Valley of the Wind, composed by Joe Hisaishi. The album contains 12 mostly instrumental pieces with titles that refer to the characters, objects, events, landscape, and themes from the film. Hisaishi himself recounts how he composed the album based on the sketches or image boards Miyazaki had made in, the pre in preparation for the film. The album was released in November 1983, four months ahead of the opening of the film. In between, these in between these two dates, Hisaishi made an album of symphonic arrangements of the compositions in the image album and composed the music for the film. After the completion of the film, the music was extracted to create the original soundtrack album released together with the film. In addition to creating a buzz around the yet-to-be-completed film among its potential fans, the Image album also gave the director a better sense of the composer's music during or even before the production period. In fact, Miyazaki is said to have worked on Naoshika while listening to Hisaishi's Image album. For Hisaishi, having produced the bulk of the musical materials beforehand enabled him to work quickly and nimbly once the time came to complete the film soundtrack. This working style also resulted in a strong connection between Miyazaki's animation and Hisaishi's music that begins with Naoshika in 1984 and has continued through their most recent collaboration, The Wind Rises, 30 years later. In this portion of my talk, I would like to turn to the soundtracks of select films, mostly by Miyazaki and Takahata, and discuss the various ways in which music contributes to the film's storytelling. I encourage you to check out the playlist Stacy, Rose, Sakuya, and I created for this presentation. One obvious way in which music figures into the narrative of the film is when its characters are depicted as musicians. In Castle in the Sky, Miyazaki shows Pazu playing the trumpet first thing in the morning. Gina from Porcoroso, also by Miyazaki, appears to us as a beautiful and sophisticated chanteuse. Music takes center stage in Whisper of the Heart, the 1995 film directed by Yoshifumi Kondo, which includes a delightful rendition of John Denver's Take Me Home Country Road, sung by Shizuku, supported by an ad hoc ensemble of violin and early music instruments. Goro Miyazaki's From Up on Poppy Hill showcases high school students and adults engaged in choral singing. In these instances, music, help, music helps communicate information about the characters and their relationship to each other. Music can also help film directors convey information about time and place of the narrative. This is particularly true for films that are set in real time and place in history, such as Takahata's Only Yesterday, a drama of young women's self-discovery that juxtaposes events that unfold in the present and her childhood recollections. At various points throughout the film, Takahata inserts popular music from the past and the present 
making the film's constant back and forth between the two temporalities audible to the viewers. Some films by Miyazaki are set in times and place that do not exist. The setting of Kiki's delivery service, for instance, is a synthetic city that weds elements of northern European Scandinavian architecture with a southern European Mediterranean flair, sometime in the 20th century where black and white TV coexists inexplicably with dirigible. Hisaishi's soundtrack for the film signals this blend of facts and fiction through his eclectic mix of diverse genres and style, including the waltz, the ragtime, and baroque music, played on mostly acoustic instruments. The prominence of European folk instruments, such as the dulcimer and the accordion, also helps in setting the appropriate mood for the film. Musical cues can also be associated with specific characters, objects, events, or locations, functioning much like leitmotifs in Wagner's opera. One memorable example of is the melody that appears multiple times in My Neighbor Totoro when you see the camphor tree. The tune actually has a title, The Path of the Wind, and even lyrics to go with it that were included in the film's image album. Hisaishi changes the instrumentation each time he presents the melody to match the mood. For instance, during the magical scene in which the trio of Totoro and Satsuki and Mei persuade the acorns they have planted to grow into an enormous tree, Hisaishi presents a melody combining the sounds of the traditional symphony orchestra with the evocative timbres of the synthesizer. The unusual mixing of sound matches the majesty of the tree and the wonder that it inspires in Satsuki and Mei. Another very famous example of leitmotif in Totoro it's a piece of melody from the film's theme song that goes something like this. Totoro, 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 totoro. Hisaishi introduces this tune when Mei spots a pair of pointy ears poking above the weeds in the backyard. The semi-translucent Totoro appears and waddles leisurely along the path. Mei starts to follow it. Hisaishi transforms the theme into a jolly march at this point. And throughout the remainder of the scene, Hisaishi arranges the melody in different ways to match the events and mood unfolding on the screen, adding to its excitement. Hisaishi also connects certain characters with recognizable timbres or distinctive sounds. A good example of this is the Omu in Naushika, the colossal king of the insects, whose presence is indicated by the understated sounds of the synthesizer that evokes the human voice. Hisaishi also marks the presence of no face in Miyazaki's Spirited Away with an un unmistakable sound of jangling bells that gets louder as no face gets bigger and more powerful. Occasionally, composers and film directors pair images and music that do not seem to go together to create memorable scenes. A heart-wrenching example of this comes toward the end of Grave of the Fireflies, directed by Takahata. In this scene, the film shows three well-to-do young women accompanied by their servants returning to their house. We hear the music emanating from an old phonograph that plays a recording of the English song Home Sweet Home. Takahata then presents us with a montage sequence centering on Setsuko, whose death we just witnessed. Composed in 1823, Home Sweet Home evokes a melancholic but peaceful vision of home in the distance. The mismatch between the idyllic vision of home in the song and the siblings' inability to fashion a safe refuge for themselves creates a profound sense of emptiness that adds to the tragedy of the situation rather than diminishing it. These are just some of the ways in which music adds to our experience of Studio Ghibli films. To conclude my brief talk, I'd like to turn to the Japanese title of Whisper of the Heart, Mimi o Sumasaba which translates to something like, when you listen carefully. I think this title suggests that we have more to gain from anime when we pay attention to its music and sound. Thank you so much for watching this talk, and I look forward to your comments and questions. What is world building and why is it important to discussing Cowboy Bebop? In contemporary fan discourse, World building is used to discuss how the genres covered under speculative fiction, such as sci-fi, fantasy, and horror, create alternate, alternate worlds that feel as authentic and lived in as our own. When the author of a fantasy novel or the camera in a sci-fi show lingers on seemingly unimportant details, like the food characters eat or the radio shows they listen to, that is a part of world building. 
It makes us believe that there is life in that world outside of what we see on screen and that we would have a place in it. Music is key to world building and in Cowboy Bebop as in so many other sci-fi shows, it plays an important role in differentiating between locations, revealing its characters and their cultures. In this regard, Cowboy Bebop has something in common with the space opera anime that came before it in the 1970s through the mid 1990s. Yet in the planning for the series, director Watanabe Shinichiro wanted to set it apart. Quote, Cowboy Bebop doesn't involve grand heroes like Star Wars, but people in modest spaceships on back roads. It's an outer space, but I wanted it to be jazz, a kind of space jazz, unquote. The focus on back roads alone sets apart the world building of Cowboy Bebop from the space focused anime that came before it. It suggests a world that is rougher, grittier, and overall less familiar. The focus on jazz, blues, and other related genres help code different areas as re representing different aspects of this future world. Key to this development is composer Kano Yoko's musical eclecticism. Kano was classically trained, but also had taken time to explore different genres of music, including jazz and blues on trips to the United States. In her career as an anime and video game composer, Kano moves between a variety of different musical styles. In the case of Cowboy Bebop, she was given particularly free reign to design the score the way she wanted, and when she wrote and recorded three times the music that was ordered by the production team, they adapted the anime to fit the score. The music she wrote spans a variety of genres, not just jazz and blues, but also rock, pop, folk, country, and even classical music and lullabies. This gave the anime a colorful palette to work with in order to illustrate its different worlds. To show this variety, I will examine a few case studies of how Cowboy Bebop depicts its different locations. Despite the focus on back roads, many of Cowboy Bebop's episodes take place in large cities, usually on Mars or on the more populated moons of Jupiter, such as Ganymede. Cowboy Bebop draws from the 1970s neo-noir and 80s cyberpunk traditions and how it illustrates these cities as both sophisticated and gritty, often switching between the two in different scenes in the same locale. The darker or more desperate scenes evoke what in her study of the neo-noir film Dirty Harry 1971, acknowledged by Watanabe as an influence in Cowboy Bebop. Film theorist Yvonne Tasker calls the noir city, which equates dark urban spaces with dubious morality. Cowboy Bebop tends to introduce new cities via wide establishing shots, playing more major key breezy jazz, emphasizing their busyness, excitement, and diversity of people and activities. Like the music, the colors in these scenes are typically bright or at least vibrant. But as the characters move into these cities, the visual and sonic palette gets darker, moving into minor keys. If the focus is on characters who have fallen in hard times, the music might shift to acoustic blues. With its tales of woe and origins among the economically impoverished region of the Mississippi Delta, it's easy for viewers to associate music of the blues genre with the rough side of life. Additionally, Cowboy Bebop's flavor of blues is often acoustic and guitar or harmonica driven. That is something that feels like it could be more easily replicated without lots of money and sophisticated equipment. Additionally, this aligns its time Stylistically more with early Delta blues rather than later electric styles. Acoustic sounds are also often associated with discourses of authenticity, something that Cowboy Bebop uses to illustrate the people of the back alleys of its world. In session six, Sympathy for the Devil, the characters enter a blues bar on Mars and are surprised that the child character, Wen, is the master at blues harmonica, having assumed that such, mu such musical prowess could only come from living a long, rough life. It turns out that this is a clue to Wen's mysterious origins, that he is actually much older, but was altered to appear forever young by the gate accident that destroyed Earth. Blues is used as an early key to the authenticity of Wen's lived experience. One of the more straightforward examples of the noir city that stands out from Cowboy Bebop's usual musical palette comes in session 20, Piero Le Fou. This session takes place largely in the metropolises of, of Mars, but it lends them a very different character from previous episodes. In Spike's hunt for the deranged serial killer Mad Pierrot, Mars is all dark shadows with the, sharp, with the steep contrasts in color associated with back alley chases like those of film noir and neo-noir. Musically, the score takes a turn toward ambient and often atonal tracks associated with horror movies, as well as similar scenes in 70s neo-noir films such as Dirty Harry. 
As Spike hunts for a kill are far more deranged and amoral than those he has met before, we see and hear the darkest, most amoral side of Mars, the world building of the noir city associated with the dubious morality of its characters. One last location that differs from the others both sonically and in terms of setting is Venus. In session eight, Waltz for Venus, the terraformed planet is shown as softer and literally greener than the others, full of floating islands with lush plant life. The sky is full of bright yellows, oranges, and pinks. The characters there seem to sit, live life at a slower pace and a remove from the busy, bustling city life seen on other planets and moons. To further this, the music shifts towards slower tempos and instrument sounds including solo harmonica and even a music box version of another theme from the series. This theme, Stella by Moore, later gets reused as Jet's leitmotif, The Singing Sea, where it changes to being performed by a jazz combo, emphasizing its sad, ballad-like nature. Yet that is absent from the twinkling rendition heard as Stella by Moore, which resembles a lullaby. Even with Spike's battle music, the jazz chosen there is different from the bombastic brass sections of other episodes' climactic scenes. There are fewer instruments, stripping it down and adding to the subdued atmosphere of Venus. While Cowboy Bebop isn't immediately associated with grand-scale world-building compared to other science fiction anime, it takes care to differentiate the various locations where its characters find themselves. In this case, the wide variety of music featured in Kano's score is in a particularly apt position to illustrate the diversity of its world. Cowboy Bebop shows how music is key to fleshing out complicated speculative fiction worlds, coloring them in just as much as visuals and storyline. Hello, and thank you for attending this Japan Foundation webinar on the power of music in anime. And thank you to Sakuya Mio and the Japan Foundation of New York. My name is Stacy Jacoy, and I am Associate Professor of Musicology at Texas Tech University. I study music and in its context of staged, filmed and animated works to better understand the roles of music in our perception and reception of media. Thank you for allowing me to share some of my work with you and I look forward to your questions. Kimi no Nawa, translated as your name, is an anime film created by Makoto Shinkai, now considered to be a full blown phenomenon in the world of Japanese animation. Following his earlier films, including Five Centimeters Per Second and The Garden of Words, Your Name was first released in August of 2016 in Japan and in short order became the highest grossing anime film ever. Japan Times has jokingly called the movie Freaky Friday for the otaku set, slice of life with a supernatural twist. If Your Name could be classified so easily, however, it would not have captured the attention of audiences the world over. The plot is boy meets girl, but with an enigmatic body swap time travel twist that has driven many fans to theorize about the plot structure, as you can see here. Taki is a high school boy living in Tokyo and Mitsuha is a shrine maiden living in the fictional countryside town of Itomori. Although they have no connection to each other, they swap bodies for several weeks which then inexplicably ends. Taki searches for Mitsuha only to find that her town had been destroyed in a natural disaster three years before. He manages to mystically reconnect with Mitsuha through a ritual that saves her, but that requires the sacrifice of that which is most dear, causing the protagonists to forget each other. Left with a nagging sense of loss, the characters are drawn to each other at the very end, closing with the question, Kimi no Nawa, what is your name? The teenage love story becomes the stage for much larger issues about memory, loss, and identity, which have globalization at their core. Your name juxtaposes opposites of modernity versus tradition, reality versus dream, science versus magic throughout. I suggest this theme of contrasts is furthered and even intensified by the musical and oral soundscapes, which assist in world building and characterization, simultaneously heightening both the magical and the realism of this magical realist movie. The success of your name is due in part to its soundtrack, which Shinkai notes had a deliberate role in the narrative of the film. 
An important instance of this is the placement of the Shinto ceremony 15 minutes into the movie, emphasizing the endurance of tradition, even after the forgetting that was caused by the great fire of Meoguro 200 years before. Mitsuha performs the Miyamisu shrine ritual, a Miko Kagura dance or God entertainment with her sister dancing with bells, shakuhachi and drum. This is the only diegetic music, music that is heard by the characters in their lived soundscape of the entire film and the only music not included in the soundtrack. Shinkai approached Jiro Moriyama to compose the piece entitled Miko Mai. Long before the animation or the storyboards even, Moriyama's choice of instruments then determined both the look and the feel of the scene. While this dance resembles other Miko Kagura in its use of bells and paper streamers, it was newly choreographed by Ichitaro Nakamura, a prominent kabuki actor, to represent and depict the loss of memory of the shrine the memory of the falling comet. After the dance, the ceremony culminates in the creation of the Kuchikamazaki Saki created through the fermentation of saliva, a key plot element later in the film. Mikomai thus ties to tradition, but also functions to defamiliarize and orientalize Mitsuha, which she rebels against, screaming afterwards that she wishes, wishes she could come back in her next life as a Tokyo boy. The rock group Radwimps was brought into the movie project at its earliest stages, and while the original idea had been to have them compose pop songs for the credits, in a bold move it was decided that the band would compose all of the music for the film. A total of 26 tracks, as you see here. The group occupied a highly interactive role in the development of the songwriting process. Uh, yo vocalist Yojiro Noda comments on the songwriting process that was happening at the same time as the animation, allowing each to influence the development of the other. This is clearly the case for the instrumental music that layers through the movie, reinforcing visual themes often tied directly to locations. This musical choice creates aural mise-en-scene, essentially world building, but also has the effect of subtly connecting Taki and Mitsuha's environments. The tension of Taki's search for Mitsuha bursts forth in track 17, again to go Shintai, with rapid pianistic fervor underscoring the passion of the moment and distorting the audience's perception of time. The theme of Mitsuha, track 21, is one of the few pieces dedicated to a character and recurs like a leitmotif woven into the fabric of the movie. The initial dissonances of the piece musically represent Mitsuha's anxiety and the dissatisfaction she feels about her life. When the cello enters, however, the piece begins to feel like a duet, orally symbolizing the two characters in one. This is why there is no musical theme for Taki. He is folded musically into Mitsuha as the music emphasizes their connections as two halves of a whole. No discussion of the music of your name would be complete without recognizing the importance of the four pop ballads listed here. Yume Toro, Dream Lantern, Zen Zen Zensei, Past 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 Lives, Sepakuru, Sparkle, and Nandemonaya, It's Nothing, which appear at different points throughout the movie. Yume Toru plays during the opening credits underscoring images of the protagonists and their respective homes, emphasizing the symbolic connection between the characters with the visual of the braided cord, the red thread of fate. This placement should make Yume Toru the theme song of the movie, but each of these four pieces carries some of the narrative weight. Zen Zen Zensei runs under the moment of discovery, highlighting the core experience of the film. Sparkle and Nande Manayo are heard during the climax and denouement respectively. Sparkle relating to the magic of the golden hour, the liminality of twilight when spirits might connect, and Nande Manayo to represent the sense of loss embodied by the characters as they unknowingly search for each other after having been mystically deprived of their memories of the other. Your Name 
asks many questions, including whether or not a movie has to have an acknowledged theme song. Into this ambu ambiguity, track eight, Zen Zen Zensei crashes through like a force of nature. Appearing 30 minutes into the drama, it supports and emphasizes the main plot point, the supernatural element of the protagonist's soul exchange. Three verses alternate with chorus, a bridge and instrumental sections at the introduction and the close. The style is pop rock with driving rhythms, a virtuosic electric guitar solo and declamatory almost patter sections alternating with slightly slower, more reflective portions toward the ends of verses. This gives Zen Zen Zensei a frantic feel that accords well with the visuals of that moment, the body swapping action of the characters, busy trying to salvage their way of life. Temporal displacement is featured noticeably near the beginning of the piece with a spliced effect that is visually mirrored in the blinking lights of Tokyo, the scrolling skies, and the rapid mo mobile phone doom scrolling. Combining these visuals, and thematic messages with lyrics and driving rhythms of the music creates an overall effect that is both modern and reflective, terrified by precariousness, but also calmed by the cyclic nature of life. Your Name is a story of loss, searching for meaning in a seemingly meaningless world, cut off from tradition and even our fellow human beings, as emphasized by the images of the concrete jungle of Tokyo, even Mitsuha in the midst of what we might call a traditional Japan is lost, lamenting her miserable life and its missing memory, repeating traditions without understanding or even wanting to understand their purpose. Your name, though, is also a story of hope. Radwimps and Shinkai have woven together the ephemeral and the tangible, rock with a healing merge of nostalgic past to create the international phenomenon that is your name. Thank you very much. All right, well, hello, and we're back again. So uh, we would like to talk about a, several different topics that um, have to do with music and anime. And so our first uh, topic, though, that we were thinking about was that although sound has been part of anime uh, as long as sound has been part of, of moving animated features, um, the moment uh, of the late 80s is really important to the way that the anime soundtracks have developed since that time. And particularly a watershed moment is the movie Akira. And so we, we can't really um, underemphasize, we can't, we can't overemphasize its importance. Um, and so we wanted to talk for just a moment about some of the aspects of, of the Akira soundtrack and then move into some of its um, some of its influences as well. So <clears throat> I wanted to start by uh, noticing that uh, again, the movie from 1988 uh, about a post-apocalyptic cyberpunk dystopian uh, world. And um, the director of course, uh, Katsuhiro Otomo uh, got the uh, Geno Yamashiro Gumi to uh, put together all of this music ahead of time. And that's really, I think, one of the most important uh, parts about the way that this music was brought into the world of Akira. And maybe even not even to say brought into it, it created the soundscape of Akira before the storyboards and before everything was put together. And so this quality of creating the music first uh, rather than a kind of afterthought, is part of what makes um, the soundtrack of Akira so important and so woven into the fabric of the movie, which has been one of the parts uh, about the movie that lots of people have commented on and, and part of its um, enduring quality. And so I wanted to mention the fact that uh, this is this is world building, um, this is storytelling. And the idea too is that the music was meant to 
be both past and future at the same time, which is why the Indonesian gamelan was brought in and why it was such an important element of, of the sound, as well as some elements of, of Japanese uh, no theater as well. And so these together um, create a, a futuristic past. But the other amazing part about gamelan, of course, is that it creates this cyclic effect. And so there isn't a strong sense of start and close that we hear in a lot of more Western music. It, it has this quality that allows it to be um, cut and placed throughout the movie. And so on that note, I thought that um, perhaps uh, Kunio might like to speak a little bit more about uh, orchestration or some of the other elements in the film. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. Um, and thank you for watching the videos that we prepared as well, everybody. So um, I wanted to kind of uh, tag on to what Stacy just talked about the the, the variety of instrument that um, Geno Yamashirogumi and especially um, Yamashiro Shoji, the, the composer of the, uh, the score uh, was interested in. And what is also interesting about uh, Akira is that this film came out in 1988. That's the same year as My Neighbor Totoro and <laughs> Grave of the Fireflies came out as well. So there's this, a lot of creativity in this um, particular time period in the late 80s. And what is particularly interesting about, I think interesting about the score is this kind of mix of old and new, right? This kind of a um, references to traditional music um, from different parts of Asia, in this case, gamelan, um, and some Japanese music and, or traditional music. And then what Geno Yamashirogumi does is to combine this with the most cutting edge technology of synthesizers and mixers and uh, samplers, um, which was used very ex extensively according to the composer Yamashiro Shoji. And here we have this conundrum of the past and the present and the cutting edge future. And this, this kind of juxtaposition of creates a sense of timelessness perhaps or confusion, right? That then, that then adds to the um, world building aspect of this, the Neo Tokyo, which simultaneously is familiar it's Tokyo <laughs> in, in, in 1988, and, but it, it, it's slightly off because of the un, unexpected fusion of the technology that people are experiencing at the moment. And then the, this traditional music, you know, kind of two opposing uh, manifestations of contemporary culture are fused together. And what, what makes um, Akira even more uncanny is that it was set in two, uh, so created in 1988, set in 2019, the world is about to explode. Well, <laughs> we, we know what happened. And Tokyo was getting ready for Olympics in 2020, right? So, hmm. so that, mm -hmm. but, but that's beside the point, but that, that's kind of fascinating about Akira and this idea of um, past and present and in the future. Um, Rose, you had been talking a little bit about some of the influences of Akira. Um, could you uh, tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I was just I was just going to say, I think a lot of anime and manga were kind of hinging on the Olympics happening this year in Tokyo, and then that didn't happen. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, I, I think um, one of the things is what uh, that I think is most influential is what Kunio talked about, which is um, the sort of uh, cultural mishmash of um, the Akira soundtrack. Um, and I think that's a thing that you start to hear a lot more in anime soundtracks going forward. Um, I mean, anime soundtracks had always been kind of musically eclectic compared to what we might be used to hearing from uh, Western animation. There was always this sort of mix of um, Japanese styles of music, traditionally Japanese styles of music and Western music. Um, but um, I think Akira um, really showed a way to uh, do that in a more unique way and a way that sounds more distinctive um, uh, as opposed to where you're obviously cueing from one or the other style, uh, which a lot of previous stuff had done. And so I think um, you can hear a lot of that influence in stuff like Cowboy Bebop, um, so, because um, Cowboy Bebop is set in this future that is very multicultural. Um, and you can see that on screen in the show that they're always, whenever they have, you know, whenever they go to a city um, and perhaps the characters are interviewing different people to figure out their, you know, bounty of the week, 
um, you always see a bunch of people of different races of different cultures um, in this futuristic civilization. And so I think Cowboy Bebop takes a major page from Akira and sort of this combination of different cultures, not just the West and Japan, but Akira also takes from the Indonesian gamelan um, and other world music traditions. And I think there's a lot of that eclecticism um, in Cowboy Bebop soundtrack as well. Um, and that's the thing I think you hear going forward, especially in other stuff that uh, Kano did. Um, in um, her soundtrack for Wolf's Reign in particular, she takes from a bunch of different world music traditions, like there's stuff from Spanish music, there's stuff from medieval European music, from Celtic music, from um, various parts of the world. Um, and But I think it's a thing that you hear more and more as a sort of taking taking chances with different world music traditions and anime soundtracks. Right. Right. And so this takes us into the essential question of, of why we're here, which is about world building. And so um, a lot of people, when they think about world building, they think first about the visuals and then they think about the, the narrative or the text. And uh, uh, those of us working in music and musicology, we really think uh, soundtrack first, but we know that we're not necessarily in the majority. Um, but it is an essential part of world building. And so um, so maybe you could talk just a little bit more about that, Rose. I'm just putting you on the spot again. Yeah, so a lot of my recent research, like post Cowboy Bebop book, um, has been about this concept called the musical moment, um, which is which was coined by Amy Herzog um, in her book, Dreams of Different Sounds of the Same, uh, musical moment in film. Um, Dreams of Different Songs of the Same. Um, I should know, I've cited this book a lot, um, but um, she, she, she coined this term um, musical moment to describe moments where the music becomes the predominant force in a particular film scene over the visuals, um, rather than the visuals being primary and the music being secondary as it usually is. And that's a thing that I've spent a lot of time analyzing in some of my more recent papers on Yuri on Ice, on I have one about Revolutionary Girl Utena coming up in the Soundscapes um, issue of Mechademia that Dr. Drakoy is um, editing. Um, and so one of the ways that um, the musical moment sort of, it sort of helps with world building is it often involves something like a musical number, like you hear in a musical. So the characters get to express themselves. We maybe get to see something of what the kind of music they listen to. But it also, um, without getting too deep into like uh, uh, theory, academic theory stuff, it often involves this sort of marking out of space and of sort of separating out particular parts of the story or physical places within a particular world as separate and then somehow outside of the normal rules of physics and time. Um, Utena does this a lot um, with the way it uses music. Um, if you've seen that anime in the dueling scenes. Um, and so that's that's been a thing that I think is, I, I think world building in general is really under discussed in terms of the soundtrack, um, as I talked about <laughs> in my lightning talk. Um, but I think that's one where people haven't really dug into as much how it works as a force of world building um, in terms of creating moments that stand out and being able to demarcate that from the rest of the world. And of course, it creates these, these moments of, of cultural specificity, uh, times where we, we really feel a sense of, of the culture that's marked through the music. Um, right, Kunio? Yeah, and interesting thing that happens when a product like anime, tra you know, created in Japan, travels to other parts of the world, it, it brings this kind of imprint of Japanese culture to other parts of the world. And some of the music, some of the sound associated that are evoked in these films might have specific cultural meaning or rather meaning that's apparent to uh, people who live in Japan for a particular time um, that might get lost or might be reinterpreted different ways. Um, so, um, I, I, I'm talking about, it's kind of a vague thing. For example, I, I think, but like when The Wind Rises, the 2013 Miyazaki film has this very interesting score in which the protagonists kind of have this dream sequence. And many of these dream sequences are accompanied by 
um, instruments that you do not expect, right? The, um, uh, the instruments such as bayan and also um, balalaika, these are Russian um, folk music, a folk instrument that are evoked here uh, that does not sound kind of, there's a mismatch between what you see in the film, which is kind of idyllic, kind of a agrarian Japan, Japanese landscape ma matched with, with European folk or folk music. And that kind of um, dissonance was intentional. So sometimes these songs, these music are included to evoke certain time period, time of the year, for example, uh, seasonal songs or specific occasion um, for New Year's or, you know, Child Children's Day or Hinamatsuri, you know, these occasions have different soundtracks and th these might be evoked, right, specific to people who live there. But at the same time, um, some composers and music directors might include um, purposefully mismatch um, to kind of add a different la another layer of meaning to the film. Right, and, and that's, yeah, that's something we, we haven't even mentioned, but, you know, will certainly, um, or, or can, which is that the music creates that layer that Rose was talking about, and, and Kuniam as well, that often supports the narrative, but can also subvert it as well, which is also very interesting when that happens. It, it, it has to be done very carefully to not look like a mistake. <laughs> uh, but when it's done really well, especially as like a parody or tongue in cheek, it can be um, exciting because the way that the music subverts or changes the narrative then uh, creates a, a whole new set of meanings in some cases. Um, and, and I was going to just mention too, the way that the music world builds in the sense of allowing us to know more about the characters because we're all familiar with the idea of, of a theme, a character having a theme that comes back again and again. And in romantic music, we talk about the leitmotif. Uh, and so that is a kind of world building as well by building the characters and allowing us to hear certain aspects of what they sound like. So, um, but I think that takes us kind of really nicely into another area uh, which is how does music make us feel things? And a lot of people ask that, you know, because I think we've all heard it as, as musicologists, music historians, how does music make us feel things? And so one of those is the motive or the motif, as we were just saying, but as, as someone here who also works in really ancient and old musics, I work in um, early modern uh, musics as well, um, one thing that goes way back in time is the idea that music has a, um, an affect uh, and it, it affects our emotions uh, partly through different modes, different, and today we only really have major and minor in Western music, but we can tell the difference between major and minor pretty quickly. And we can also, we have some associations with those modes. Uh, and then there are other modes that, that go back in Western history, uh, Dorian and Phrygian and Lydian and Mixolydian. And when those get used by um, composers today, they evoke a kind of sound of olden days kind of thing. Um, and they have other associations too. So that's one way music makes us feel things. Um, I think sound effects was another area we were going to talk about. Yeah, so I, I love the discussion of the modes because one of the opening melody or tune that you hear in um, Naushka of the Valley of the Wind is this Dorian mode melody that gives this evoke this ten sense of timelessness, ten sense of the past, even though we uh, the movie it's, uh, the the anime itself is set in this future, right? But sound effect is super interesting because that film um, that anime Naushka of the Valley of the Wind is full of these insect noise and that that's important part of the world building that we just talked about but it kind of creates this um sense of fear uh, to to us because you know we are insects at, at that size it's kind of scary <laughs> so you have this, this loud noise of insects you you freak out another another famous insect noise is the no sound of the cicadas in um evangelion 
right? Uh, we, we, I think the previous episode of the series talked about how, you know, that signifies the kind of eternal summer that the world ha is kind of kind of dislodged in because of the catastrophe. So um, these sound effects are very important in creating a sense of making us feel a certain way um, or tell us some story. Uh, a, a fascinating thing about, um, I think, My Deba Totoro, uh, going back to that film, uh, the anime, is the amount of kind of depiction that Miyazaki does in kind of um, amount of time that he spent depicting daily activities, like pumping the <laughs> well or cutting, you know, chopping vegetables. And all of these mo mo motions are accompanied by sound effects. And these sound effects apparently were uh, actually, um, not not fully artists, but rather they were uh, sampled by um, go going to the location and sampling similar sounds. So they were meant to evoke, um, you know, particular reaction from, especially from adult audience who were who grew up with these machines or tools or um, lifestyle, and and these were one of the devices that was meant to evoke a certain make, make the audience feel a certain way. Now. The children who are watching have no association, so they, they have to ask their parents, well, what, what's the significance of these sounds? But that was another moment of kind of uh, a, a different ways in which a uh, movie might mean, diff, you know, create different meanings to different people depending on their experience. Right, through through different kinds of orality and, yeah. and soundscapes. But, um, and uh, Rose, we were talking a little bit about uh, genres, right? And, and how, genres can affect our feelings? Yeah, so one of the things we were talking about earlier is sort of the concept of the leitmotif and there being sort of a spectrum. Um, because a lot of people, um, when talking about film music, expect it to be very leitmotif based, but it increasingly is not. Um, uh, leitmotif is a very particular, um, uh, it's, it's a very particular technique where you have a particular musical theme associated with a character, or object, etc. And when you see a movie that uses it a lot, like the Star Wars movies, you know, it's very distinctive. Um, and so I think a lot of stuff instead sort of works on this spectrum of associating different things besides just individual musical themes with particular characters, places, objects, etc. And I think that you often hear that with uh, genres um, and with instruments. And so that's one of the things that I was trying to discuss in sort of the Cowboy Bebop world building like one of the things I notice um, that is different about say the, you know, places like Venus um, and in some of the places that are more run down um, is this use of acoustic instruments, use of guitar, use of harmonica and Venus, this, this sort of tranquil use of gentle tranquil instruments like music box type sounds. Um, and then we hear when we're in this big city the big, shiny, sophisticated city, um, more electronic instruments, um, and if they're acoustic, stuff like brass instruments, big bands, not just like a solo guitar. Um, and so that, so that's one way, that, and, and there are also instruments um, that are used to make um, a so leitmotivic type associations with particular versions of themes, for example, um, Jet's theme, The Singing Sea, you actually hear that as Stella by Moore in Waltz for Venus, but then it gets reused as his theme when they move it to a jazz combo as opposed to the music box. Um, so, and then, and then the association with genres as well. Um, that was sort of um, the concept that I think um, it took a lot of from genres like um, uh, the Western and film noir, which are genres that use particular types of music um, as, you know, codes for specific things that I think Cowboy Bebop um, adapts as well. Um, with st stuff like, um, but we hear this in film all the time. You know, if you're watching um, something that suddenly mm -hmm. travels to a different country and that country has a particular kind of genre of music associated with it, often the way that they'll signal that they're moving to that new place is through a musical theme. Um, and so you have this stuff that often works in a leitmotivic way that isn't actually a leitmotif. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, one other way that, that music really infiltrates the world of anime is also through uh, this idea that this, this media mix idea uh, of 
the other things that are part of the, the world of anime, things that get sold, consumed uh, by fans and, and all over the world get spread around. And so one thing um, is that, that our soundtracks are part of that and uh, soundtracks get, get sold and remixed and, um, and then other products and other types of things come out of that as well. And so we wanted to talk about that for just uh, a few moments. Uh, and so one of the, the soundtracks that really started this um, and, and did very well with it selling its soundtrack was Cowboy Bebop. Mm -hmm. uh, so Rose was maybe going to tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so um, one of the things uh, that was really interesting in um, researching Cowboy Bebop was learning about the production process and the way the soundtrack was marketed, um, which a lot of why that anime was possible is because um, of the soundtrack in two different ways. One is that um, uh, the sound, so soundtracks in anime, are, in TV anime at least, are usually made well before the animation and the script and all the other pieces come together. Um, this was the case in Cowboy Bebop too, but what happened that was interesting with that is that um, Yoko Kano was kind of just allowed to go to town to a certain degree. Like she was given, she was given a list of, you know, we want this thing in this genre, this thing in this genre, we want a love theme, we want an action theme, et cetera. But she wrote three times what she was given. And a lot of what she wrote for particular stuff was not actually how it was used in the anime. Um, and so they kind of just had this massive amount of music and they're like, okay, what do we do with this? And it went way over budget. Um, and there were a lot of there were a lot of scenes that were retooled to focus on the music. For example, Spike's big confrontation with Vicious in episode five, Bell of Fallen Angels, where he's walking into the church and Rain, the song is playing. Um, that was originally all dialogue and they scrapped most of it to focus on the song. Um, mm -hmm. And so, um, but the problem with that is that this massive amount of music went, that Calvary Bebop went way over, over budget. So a lot of how they worked how they made back that money was actually through the marketing of the soundtrack itself, selling CDs, this was 1998, um, and um, concert tours and stuff like that. Um, and so it was, it was a really early, it was a relatively early, because obviously there had been soundtracks sold before, but it sort of set a model for how um, soundtracks and anime can be used as a form of ancillary income. And also like how, you know, anime fandoms are really, um, passionate about um, soundtracks and there's a market for you know big concerts featuring you know not just the j-pop artists in the opening and ending but even the composers who wrote you know the background music so um some of the other ways that uh, music gets incorporated then um or gets consumed really i guess um beyond buying the soundtrack might also be um sheet music uh right Video? Yeah, sheet music is a enormous part of at least the Ghibli kind of fandom, right? So there, there are, um, I don't have it with me, but um, there are um, many publications of, um, you know, selection of you know, music from My Neighbor Totoro or selection of Ghibli films uh, in a collection of, um, for piano of, of various levels, like beginner level, medium level, <laughs> not medium, but, you know, not so beginner levels, right? And then um, and I remember playing um, pieces from Ghibli film in uh, middle school marching, not marching, but middle school bands, right? So, so there are arrangements of um, these uh, music that are made in real time <laughs> to be consumed by um, children and um, young adults um, in school settings, right? So, so these were performed. Um, and of course, uh, this kind of experience, I think, create a, a special bond with the audience, right? They're not just consuming like anime passively, but they're actually creating something. They're creating music, not just creating by yourself, but creating with other people, right? This kind of communal experience that really kind of creates a special bond, I think. It's another layer of a fandom uh, that is really fascinating with music. Um, I, I also have um, some really vintage Naushika <laughs> CDs I bought when I was <laughs> like 11 or 12. Um, I also have this plush toy of <laughs> Totoro. <laughs> so there are many different ways in you know, media mix work. But I think one of the most fascinating example of this today um, is that Naushika 
of the Valley of the Wind became turned into a, kab a kabuki play uh, recently in 2019. And it was uh, performed and kind of um, uh, streamed online. And now I think they're coming out with a DVD and Blu-ray in 2021, right? So if you're interested, you should check that out because that is a fascinating example of how uh, anime is adapted into a very traditional, very kind of, you know, very different medium with different convention. It, it really works in unexpected ways. Right, definitely. And Naruto was done also as a kabuki, I believe. And um, and Roni Kenshin anime was done uh, by the Takarazuka Review as a musical. Um, and, you know, of course, we could go into live action and so many other things. Uh, and so music plays a, a, an integral part in a lot of those as well as in video games. That's a whole extra, uh, that's a whole different webinar right there. Mm -hmm. um, so well, we had a lot of uh, registrants for this event who um, asked us questions ahead of time. And so uh, we wanted to get to some of those. And the first one uh, is, what music um, did anime help you to discover? And so, you know, we're musicologists. We think we know music pretty well, but we also know that anime turned us on to uh, different things. So anyone like to go first? I know I didn't know about Radwimps at all until I heard them <laughs> your name and then I got hooked and had to go back and look for a lot more of their recordings because what I heard in, in your name just really intrigued me about their style. Uh, and so I've, I've listened to a lot more J-pop than I had ever done before. Um, and so that's, that's a quick answer, but I'll hand it over to uh, my colleagues. Um, I think, yeah, I think I discovered a lot of Japanese popular music through it. Um, like I discovered Shibuya K through studying, um, through studying Japanese popular music, through studying anime, um, the anime soundtracks, and now I love it. Um, but, um, I think, a, I think a lot of it was that a lot of it's also just discovering, I feel like I discover one soundtrack I really like, then I look up everything else the composer did and I find out more stuff by them. Um, I've even discovered non-anime film soundtracks I really like um, because like researching the Cowboy Bebop book, for instance, I had to watch not only a lot of other anime, mm -hmm. but also a lot of other, you know, uh, live action films. Mm -hmm. um, so like I'd always known I liked the music of Ennio Morricone, but I think this was the first time I actually watched those um, spaghetti westerns that he did um, his soundtracks for, the the $3 films with Clint Eastwood. Mm -hmm. um, and I also watched Dirty Harry. Way too much Clint Eastwood I had to watch for this <laughs> <laughs> research for this. Well, I liked all these movies. Um, and uh, yeah, and then I discovered I love that soundtrack. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, there's a lot of, I think, there's been so much music and movies that I've discovered through um, initially just being an anime fandom and then be, be studying it as an academic. Right. Yeah. So uh, obviously, I confess that I, you know this was one of the earliest CDs I bought as a young person. So so Joe Hisaishi was a, you know a discovery that I made myself right as a kid. And I think there's something special when you when you're like growing up and finding an artist that you really like. And you know Joe Hisaishi was for me. <laughs> it's like I really got into. Now that kind of passion kind of dwindled right as I grew older, and then in in the past kind of few years I've been writing about anime music and, and that really rekindled my interest in Joey Saichi and since then I really discovered the kind of musician he was really um, before uh, writing uh, writing for anime there's a really substantial amount of really interesting work that he did as a um, kind of a contemporary art contemporary music composer and since then he has also composed many um, like Rose said um, live action films and the, um, they're really great ones too and then recently he's even composing <laughs> orchestral composition today right so uh, there's lots to discover and by exposing myself to all of these um you know completely different um style um genre of um music and um, films and anime it, it's really has been a very great discovery for me Nice. I also like um, that I've discovered or rediscovered some classical music that I knew fairly well 
uh, when it gets used in anime. Um, so some Chopin pieces that uh, I've heard in several anime as well as um, uh, there's a huge scene in Roni Kenshin that uses the Muscogni uh, piece and it's, huh? you know, it Oh, we may have lost Stephanie. What does this opening do to be so impactful, catchy, whoops, and interesting in the eyes and ears of the viewers? Um, was that about Cowboy Bebop? Because you were frozen for a moment there. Oh, sorry. Cowboy Bebop opening is the greatest of all time. <laughs> what does the opening do to be so impactful and catchy for uh, its viewers? I mean, I think for it, it's a combination of the visuals and the music. Um, I think it's the, the music side of things is that it's so fast paced um, and it sort of has this strong sense of cool, starting with that like opening, uh, uh, let's blow the scene three, two, one, let's jam. Mm -hmm. um, and then launching into, and then launching into the um, instrumental theme. Um, but I think it's also like the very James Bond Esque visuals. Like it has this, it has this very James Bond feel to it overall. The music sounds a lot like what you'd expect from a Bond movie, um, and then the visuals um, and the way that and those bright primary colors and how everybody's in shadow has a very strong James Bond aesthetic to it. So I think that's part of what, um, in you know, in viewers' imaginations, um, makes it feel so exciting and so cool. Mm. Great. Well, so um, another question for us then is, um, I, I think a really interesting one about the way that music was um, put to different anime as it traveled around the world, how the music was translated or changed. Um, and so our viewer also, our registrant says, uh, sometimes disregarding the original music or lyrics and change the music completely, uh, like in um, Kimba or Marine Boy, for instance. Uh, and so I think we can all speak to this uh, in different ways, but there was for a while, certainly all the way up until the 90s, when anime moved globally, it was, I believe, uh, an, uh, an idea that it needed a localized music to make it more appealing to audiences. And so the music would then change from place to place uh, to adapt and uh, try to, to hit its target audience a little bit better. But that creates so much uh, disconnect for viewers, especially if they hear the original version and then against the version that they were familiarized with, um, especially if they were younger viewers at the time. Uh, anyone else want to jump in here? Um, yeah. I. Um... What, one, of, one of the things that was really interesting to me a few years ago that I've talked with you two about um, was when Sailor Moon was um, re-released in the like full uncut uncensored version in, in the US for the first time. Um, Cause I grew up with the um, heavily censored version that was airing on TV in the nineties. Um, and there's a lot of discourse out there about all the various ways that it's been censored like, you know, taking out queer characters and so on. Um, but I think one thing I haven't heard as much about is how the soundtrack was different and how I feel like I, I don't even dislike the soundtrack of the dubbed version that came out in the 90s. Like there are actually a lot of things I like about it, but it was a very much like trying to make it sound like every other girl power show that was on TV in America at the time. And I found out that a lot of the soundtrack, they'd cut all this classical music that mm -hmm. was really interesting, that was used in lots of really interesting ways, um, often for like there's a scene late in the first season where they're battling the big bad. Um, and um, they're, then it's very scary and they just don't have music during this particular confrontation in the um, original US Canadian dub. Um, where, whereas in the Japanese version, they play Vivaldi, um, the last movement of summer from the four seasons. And it's really cool. Um, and I was just, I, I get that they probably couldn't use that recording because of rights reason, but I was thinking, you know, why just cut it? Why not put something equally interesting in there? Um, yeah, I could go on and on about all the stuff I watched as a kid, but I won't. 
the the rights issue is really interesting. The kind of the legal structures, um, you know, copyright issue that makes certain kind of insertion of music difficult to do. One thing I like to talk about is, you know, I think very early on, uh, uh, Kiki's Delivery Service has a very famous dub version in the U.S. That um, there's a beautiful, great article in Macademia by Alex Roder who goes through and kind of parse out the difference between the U.S. dub version. Um, from the late 90s, early 2000s, and then the original version in 1989. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I recently listened to the dub version. It, it does. It is quite radically different from. Um, I mean, it's subtle, but it sounds quite different. And what I think the adaptation tries to do, or localization tries to do, is to mitigate some of the silences. So uh, this is kind of characteristic of many Japanese films and anime. Uh, uh, not all of them, but um, there are a lot, lot of moments of silence, that, like there's lack, lack of background music in many scenes and for, for, uh, to make a certain point, but um, which is not always the case with Western or Hollywood film, especially there's kind of necessity to kind of have continuous music or rather that's the aesthetic, right? They, they want music to be continually commenting on or providing information about what's going on. And I think um, these newer additions are sometimes made to do that, or there are some sound effects that are added uh, to kind of indicate certain signals, certain um, kind of comic situation or in terms of character. So all, all of this is to say is that, you know, I, I don't think localization itself is a kind of a, it's not a question of good or bad, but, but rather difference that, you know, it's really actually fascinating to compare different versions of this. And we learned a lot about the culture that created and culture that adopts it. And I think it gives us, as scholars, I think we love these different versions because there's more to talk about things. Yeah. I was gonna say Digimon's dub soundtrack does that too, where it, it has this sort of constant music mm -hmm. um, to it that I, I think sometimes, sometimes it works better, but a lot of times it kind of just drains the impact of big moments mm -hmm. because there isn't a difference yeah. sonically between them and lesser moments. Whereas the Japanese soundtrack um, is a lot less like that yeah. a lot <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, so good all right well um we have one uh well from a music theory perspective this, this question is uh what if any are the stylistically japanese influences on joe saishi's compositions versus western influences would you say yeah so excuse me so um, there are many, several noticeable uh, make instances of references to Japanese music in Hisaishi's score. And um, Hisaishi himself was trained in uh, Western style music from early on. He was a, a student of violin in the Suzuki you know, class, uh, school um, method. So, and he went to a, he studied composition at one of the university's music schools in Tokyo. So he had a very rigorous kind of Western style music education, which was already in place in Japan in by the late 19th century. So there's a long tradition of that. Um, so he himself did not grow up um, um, practicing or composing in traditional Japanese music. But there are instances, um, for, uh, for example, my neighbor Totoro has a, um, the Path of the Wind that I talked about in the video. Um, has a particular form of pentatonic scale called Nyirokunuki, like a pentatonic scale without the second and sixth degree, um, which uh, kind of evokes this more folk-like tradi Japanese traditional music. And he layers that with more Western tonality, uh, harmonies and kind of minimalistic sound, kind of accompanimental style and synthesizer. So mix of this Western kind of a contemporary music and then traditional evocation of traditional Japanese music creates this really unique soundscape that adds the magic of that, you know, the, the, the tree that it represents. And of course, uh, another one would be Spirited Away, right? Yeah. I mean, with lots of elements of, of Japanese culture woven into that soundtrack. Spirited Away is very interesting because um, when the when you hear the kind of the party music of the gods, you hear this like a lively kind of music in the background, and what what you hear is actually uh, kind of a music or melody based on 
the scale patterns that you find in Okinawan music. So Okinawa is the southern island in Japan, and from the mainland perspective, it's sort of a remote island with a special culture, right? To to cut, to evoke <laughs> the music of that culture in this, you know, most the representation of gods, Japanese uh, indigenous god is really interesting kind of a twist that I, I, I found it really uh, fascinating. So um, another question we have then is, um, has Makoto Shinkai's heavy use of Radwimp's pop music in his films changed the way people think of anime film scoring? And I think we could probably all weigh on on this, but um, my take is that what this has done is show a lot of different uh, people, both fans and people on the direction and production side, that um, to have the group and the, the musical style woven so tightly into the way that the story developed uh, is an important quality in uh, a, a movie's development, or at least I hope that that is one of the things that has been conveyed to other directors and producers out there, um, is that music isn't really just an afterthought, and it isn't necessarily something that you should just collage in. Um, when the music is part of the production, and the animators speak to the musicians and the musicians speak back to the animators. They had some really uh, fruitful moments in, in that production that both um, Shinkai and Rad Wimps have talked about in interviews. And so to have that kind of connection going on through the anime, I think really made it powerful. Uh, and the only criticism I've heard of the music is, oh, at points, I, I don't remember it. And I actually think that that, even though it's lodged as the criticism, is actually kind of good because it means the music has fit so well into its story that it's not standing out in an obvious way. They've, they've woven it in so that it doesn't stand out mm -hmm. as out of place. And when you do hear it, when you do notice it, then it's really part of the narrative and that's part of why it stands out. So it feels like it's very intentional. And I hope that other directors and producers are taking note of that collaborative quality that happened with that movie in particular. Um, either of you have any thoughts on that as well? Or we could probably move to our next. You said it beautifully, Stacey. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so how, was the, um, how has the evolution of music consumption uh, this is our next question. From radio to file sharing to streaming, affected music and soundscapes in anime? This is a really fascinating question because, of course, um, over our lifetimes, we've all uh, used lots of different uh, forms of music uh, recording, um, going back to vinyl, certainly, uh, and magnetic. <laughs> And, uh, and, and every different medium has its own limitations, but also strengths as well. Um, would either of you want to jump in on that? I thought, I thought for a second you were going to say, maybe not Rose, but no, I'm, I'm old enough that I had analog tapes. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yeah, um, I, was, I think like part of it is that music's become a lot more accessible um, around the world, it's a lot easier to get into obscure types of music. So I think that's allowed like something what Aki, like what Akira did which is this sort of combination of very different global styles of music to be something that um, more composers can do because it's you know way easier to discover Indonesian gamelan in 2020 than it was in 1988. Yeah, and I think um, you know I think we talked about I I showed how I collected CDs right, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and then um, again when CDs came out I think everybody were wowed by the quality of this pristine quality of CDs, right? And then LP became kind of forgotten. But um, more recently, I, and I think 2018 starting, um, Studio Ghibli has reissued many of these old soundtracks as vinyls. And I actually bought some vinyls of Totoro. Um, and it does have this special kind of a, it, it feels different. <laughs> it's a tactile feeling to it. And what was kind of fascinating with the the, even with the reissue of My Neighbor Totoro, I should have brought it with me, but it has um, 
um, liner notes, like much bigger liner notes, because it's so physically bigger, the liner notes are actually bigger. And the liner notes um, insert with the vinyl had um, sheet music in it, um, so you can sing right. along, right? And, mm -hmm. and so, so this was another way in which even if you buy this media, you can participate. Um, yes, and I think to the point that Rose made about um, Akira, and, uh, availability of these kind of different kinds of music that was definitely the case in the 1980s right in Japan um, you know Japan by this time was the, like the second biggest like market of music right <laughs> next to US there are lots of um, interest in world music was happening in Japan in the you know the 70s and 80s and you know th these musical samples or recordings were available uh, to many composers and that was one of the reasons why I think many um, film musicians were drawn to these sounds of um, different cultures, different traditions. Right, right. And, and another thing um, to think about when we think about the different types of media <clears throat> is this idea too that different uh, ways of consuming the music also affect the way that musicians write it and what they write it for and what they anticipate that the audience can and cannot hear. Uh, and so when some of these older anime get remastered, we, we can hear different things. And um, we were talking about that uh, actually with, with Akira because yeah. it was originally done on DAT. Uh, and DAT has a lot of information to it that may not have come out in some of the other media in between. But now I think with the most recent, with the Blu-ray, they were able to um, put some of those tracks back in. And so the music sounds closer now uh, than it did on say CD technology um, because Blu-ray has more availability to create that richer sound quality and, and more information. So, um, but, uh, but certainly, I mean, anime uh, takes advantage of a, of a lot of these different sounds because, and, and this isn't something we, we've touched on as a main topic, but just, um, just for a moment to say that, you know, how is sound for live action different than anime? And we can say, oh, well, you know, the sound for anime is basically the same as it is for live action in many ways. But anime and, and animation in general creates a, a kind of a different expectation from the audience mm -hmm. and allows, um, I think, maybe more um, fantasy, uh, more change in genres. Um, it, it allows for things to maybe be mixed in different ways. Um, and I know that anime scholars have, have been working on a lot of these questions as well, but it's part of, of uh, what we think about too with anime music is, are we just talking about film music, but with animated characters? And yes and no. No? So um, the, the last question we have here then I think is, um, uh, how are different musical traditions resampled in uh, Japanese anime and would you see problematic forms of sampling given the discourse on cultural appropriation? Well, I think um, I dealt a lot with that, I think, in my book, um, particularly not so much the parts that I talk about here, but um, talking about the episode um, Mushroom Hunt, um, yeah, M Mushroom Samba, Mushroom Hunting is the song <laughs> that is played in it. Um, uh, which is a uh, which is an homage to black exploitation films um, from the 1970s, um, and uh, I think a lot of people watching it who aren't familiar with those movies, like maybe aren't aware specifically of like how a lot of what comes off initially as racist caricatures is really just lifted straight from these movies that were made um, for black audiences initially black by black creators, but Hollywood very quickly took over it. Um, uh, so it's, it's, but it's still like when you take it out of that cultural milieu and you move it to a different one where people don't necessarily have those associations, I think that, you know, regardless of what your intent is, there can still be, you know, problems in terms of what you're communicating, um, especially as anime is like no stranger to racist caricatures involving black people. I mean, they're 
popular anime still today, like Dragon Ball Z and um, arguably Pokemon with the character of Jinx um, that had basically blackface caricatures in them long, long after that wouldn't have been socially acceptable in mainstream American media. So like I, as I always try to tell my students um, is like, you know, intent is part of it. Yes. But, you know, somebody watching it doesn't necessarily know what your intent is. Um, and so something can have issues, um, even if you do your best. Kunia, did you uh, want to jump in on that at all? Or? Well, I think Rose really did a very sensitive um, kind of this description of this because, uh, yeah, so you, this kind of um, the gap between the experience of people in Japan um, to, with this music. Now, it, this is not to say that, you know, people in Japan don't understand <laughs> how racism works or how racism affects people in America. But I, I think um, the, the lived experience is very different. And another interesting thing, uh, important thing is that um, there are a lot of American musicians, including black musicians in Japan who, you know, who come to Japan for, for various reasons and stay and perform. And sometimes these artists are included in the production of music, you know, music industry in Japan too. So, so it is a very complicated issue, and and I think that's it's it's worth something that we should all think about moving ahead. But it's a great question that um, the participant really posed us, and it's a challenge because it is complicated. I mean, most of the time when we think about again, cultural appropriation, as, as Rose said really well, I mean, intent and, and then how it comes out. But I mean, we can only hope, of course, that for the most part, these things are handled sensitively, uh, you know, moving forward, especially. But um, but there are some, some amazing examples. Uh, I was just doing work not too long ago on Samurai Champloo. Uh, and so, you know, there's some amazing um, quotes in there throughout of the music of, of regional Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's done really sensitively and, and really highlights the, um, the, the heterogeneity of, of yeah. Japanese archipelago. So, you know. And I think in, that, in the case of that anime, it's interesting that it uses hip hop so much because of course hip hop is also a very regional within right. the US and also around the world style. Um, but, um, I, yeah, I also, I mean, that was a case where New Jabez often collaborates or collaborated because mm -hmm. uh, he's passed away, um, with, um, American, um, hip hop artists. Mm -hmm. So like, I think that's another thing you have to think about with cultural appropriation is like the individuals involved from different cultures. How do they feel about it? Right. Um, because it, like, I, I think like what you said, Kunio, is that, you know, it's seen differently in Japan. So like for I, I often feel like, you know, I want to make sure I'm not imposing my Western American view of cultural appropriation on a different culture that views it a different way and therefore possibly being imperialist in my own way, I guess. Um, and yeah, <laughs> so complicated. It is complicated, but I, I think it's incumbent upon, you know, people who are producing this culture, if you want to be global <laughs> and truly um, understandable outside the world, outside of Japan, then this kind of issue has to yeah. be, it's available, information is there, so. Um, One of my friends put it as, um, okay. one of my friends who, who's also an anime writer put it as, you know, once your culture exports their products, the rest of the world gets to comment on it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I think we're wanting to uh, possibly go to the live chat. Yes. Any questions you have for us? Yeah. Live chat. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, I'm That's back. Hi, hi. I'm back. Thank you so much for your great questions, everyone. Now, I would like to pick some questions from the live chat, too, as we have a lot of great questions here. I would like to extend time a little bit. The first question is um, to, Ro to Rose. So. Any sort of musical moments in Samurai? Oh, this is actually the combination of two questions. Um, any thoughts on musical moments in Samurai Champloo? Is it a parallel to Cowboy Bebop? And then 
What are the emotional reactions that you think are derived from jazz music in a varying context of cowboy bebop, samurai champloo? And what do you think square the creators to utilize these? Well, um, samurai champloo is, it's interesting both in the way it's similar to bebop and the way it's different. Um, because like the, there is some jazz, but it's really, a hip hop soundtrack and the jazz that is there is used in the way it's used in sampling and hip hop. Um, so the same way that you would hear it when you're listening to Nas um, sampling it. Um, uh, but like, um, I think I think it's interesting um, that there are a lot of similarities in the ways it's used, particularly like say the fight scenes. Um, Cowboy Bebop loves to use really fast paced big band jazz when Spike is getting into some very physical karate-ish fight with someone. And um, uh, Samurai Chimbu did similar things with the hip hop um, when Mugen gets into um, a fight with someone. And it's interesting how his fighting style is also influenced in that sense. And that it's a, you know, it's partly traditionally Japanese karate style and partly it looks like uh, break dancing. Um, and so I think Samurai Chimbu often incorporates um, hip hop cult, hip hop culture in a in a deeper sense um, into its world building, um, and that you know you often have these anachronistic um, references to it, like graffiti um, mm -hmm. on the side of a temple or something. Um, and, but you know, and I think Cowboy Bebop's use of jazz is often it, it's still incorporated in there, obviously, because if you watch the opening credits, they have that text talking about how you know they were influenced for like the characters are supposed to be like bebop musicians but i think it's subtler like it's mm -hmm. not as direct here is some i visual iconography that we associate with jazz it's more you know the characters act in this very improvisatory way um so i think you have to dig a little bit more whereas samurai champlu is very upfront about and also i think the fact that it takes it's a historical um anime helps too because that makes the juxtaposition between hip hop culture and Edo period Japan much starker. Whereas like, you know, there's no reason to believe there's an anachronism of people listening to jazz in the late 21st century. It's true. Did that answer that question? Mm, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so let's, those two, I have, a, we have our questions to um, Stacy for their your name and about your in the presentation. Your name, you mentioned how the Miko Kagura scene is the only scene in the film which diegetic music. Do you think this is an inter intentional choice meant to highlight the contrast between religion, past and the present? And also one more question. Makoto Shinkai director, your name, and a weathering with you, which have a similar vibe of original soundtrack in it. But how do they dif differentiate the music from both movies so that they won't overshadow each other? Mm. Mm. So um, back to the first part of that question, um, I do think that the uh, music, the, the diegetic music um, in the soundscape of your name, the use of that that Kagura music is is very intentional. And part of what's um, what really stands out about that when you go back and, and watch that scene is that there are no musicians there. Uh, it's actually on a tape that they show at one point off in the corner that's running on an old magnetic tape that's clearly been recorded and part of that um, temple for probably a couple decades. Uh, at that point. And so there's this very um, deliberate uh, use of that music that is being um, shown as being older and part of that community. And so certainly it's meant to, uh, to highlight that idea of this strong, important uh, Shinto uh, worship past that uh, that then ties into the rest of the 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 movie and the idea that the characters um, have this strong connection with both memory and forgetting. 
And so uh, the music carries part of that meaning, as does the dance. And if they were to really focus on, and you can see it too when you watch the dance, is that the sisters recreate the idea of the um, meteor as it falls and breaks apart. And so the dance, and they lost, of course, in the storyline, they lose all of their records for the shrine, but they remember the dance because it's part of their oral lived history. So, so that's really intentional, I think, on, on Shinkai's part um, and, uh, and why he spent uh, a good amount of time bringing in traditional musicians and um, kabuki uh, actors to make sure that it was done in a sensitive and, and, and in historically correct sort of way. Um, the second question though, uh, so um, I didn't hear the second movie um, that you were, that was mentioned. I know- Weathering with you. Weathering with, oh, you. Weathering with you, right. So how is it that, again, he uses Radwimps um, for both of these movies and um, Weathering with you is such a different soundtrack, right? I mean, Zen Sen Zensei uh, is the one that we talk about a lot in Your Name and it's so, fast and it's driven and like I said in the lightning talk kind of frantic almost um, which is part of this whole storyline of we're moving so fast that we're forgetting who we are and that's the story right but weathering with you um, has a totally different storyline right I mean it's it's uh, more about this idea of of being sensitive to people and their their needs and their emotions and uh, the way that, of course, you know, she's able to create the rain. And that main song, that main soundtrack piece is so, um, it's it's a soft, slow ballad, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it, it hits you in a completely different way than the music of Your Name. And so even though Radwimps is doing both of them, I think they took special care to make sure that the soundtrack of, of Weathering It With You would be different and sound different um, from the theme song or whatever we call the theme song, all the way to the rest of the music as well and have a, and have a way that the music really tries to be part of the narrative. So, and of course, as I said before, the way they collaborate allows that to be even more effective. Mm. Oh, thank you. Um, since we are almost out of time, we have to make this next question our last for today. Uh, wait, which one? Mm. Okay, um, this is kind of like an overall question. Do you think at the end, the soundtrack in anime reflect Japanese culture? Do you see Japanese culture at the end? Hmm. I think it depends on the soundtrack. Mm. I mean, that's the easy answer, but I, <laughs> I think that I think it depends. Um, then I so I think sometimes it does, um, sometimes it doesn't. But I feel like I feel like it's always kind of in there, and I feel like that's true of anime in general. Is so there's always you might not be able to like figure out what's specifically about it, je ne sais quoi, but there's always like something distinct about it that sets it apart from stuff you'd find in other parts of the world. So maybe that's the Japanese-ness of it. I think the eclecticism of, you know, the ability to draw on different kinds of musical tradition, mm -hmm. um, the kind of voracious appetite for different style of, um, you know, cultural product that, uh, that w which is part of, you know, reflection of the economic standing of Japan in the post-war period, but also kind of a you know, curiosity that um, many people have about the world outside. At the same time, kind of synthesizing in a way that makes sense in the, in the local culture. So uh, all of this, I think, is you know, reflective of what Japanese people are experiencing today, or at least in the past few decades. So in that sense, I think it is reflective of Japanese culture. But um, yeah, so that's my answer. <laughs> and I, I would definitely second that uh, idea of eclecticism that we hear throughout um, anime soundtracks. Uh, and that's what I was gonna say. But the other thing I was thinking about also uh, was the fact that um, Japanese musical audiences seem to also really respond to um, ideas of virtuosity in music. Mm -hmm. 
And we hear a lot of that highlighted in the music and anime, uh, you know, and it ties in with characters and it ties in sometimes with places. And so like, for instance, with your name, uh, the beginning of Zen Zen Zensei starts with that really virtuosic riff that it then closes with as well. And so, you know, that's just one tiny example. But I think that um, along with the eclectic eclecticism, this idea of collecting musics from different places that also have a, a really strong kind of virtuosic quality or something that's considered to be really beautiful, mm -hmm. um, even if it's very different, is also a reflection of, of a, a Japanese aesthetic. Mm -hmm. And so, and I hear that um, reflected in a lot of anime soundtracks, so. Yeah, I think, I think you guys are, I like your answers better than mine. Uh, but yeah, um, what, what else was, I, I think I had another comment that was um, building off what uh, Kunio said. Yeah, I have, um, I, I often get people who don't know anime very well, like, you know, assuming that anime soundtracks would be full of like, you know, traditional Japanese music. Um, and I mean, they can be, like, especially if it's set like in the past or something. But like, I think what you said, Kunio, about sort of the modern Japanese person's listening habits, and that that being, that being what anime reflects rather than some idea of traditional Japanese culture. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's not to say that, you know, eclecticism itself is equal Japanese, but the fact that there's availability of these all sorts of musical, you know, outlets is part of the story. Yeah, yeah definitely. Well, wow, thank you so much. And uh, I hope we could cover many of your questions in a um, live discussion and a Q&A session. So that's all for tonight. I would like to give a big thank you to our special guest speakers, Dr. Hara, Ms. Bridges, and Dr. Jokoi for sharing their expertise. And um, our next session will be about legendary anime director, Satoshi Kon, creator of Perfect Blue and Paprika. It's been 10 years since he passed at the age of 46. Every time I watch his works, I can't stop thinking where anime would be today if he was still with us. As a last session this year, and on the 10th anniversary of his passing, we would like to trace his legacy and impact in the film industry for, from multiple angles. It will be held on Saturday, December 12th. Please register from the link below. Finally, before you go, please fill out a quick survey in the description and tell us what topics you are interested in for future episodes. And we hope you will enjoy the playlist on Spotify. And thank you again for joining us today. Please continue to stay safe, and we will see you again soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Sabia-san. Yeah, thank you for this opportunity. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.